I'd like to thank Danny Mendez, Camilia Suleiman, Gabriela Alcaraz, and Miguel Cabañas for inviting me to participate in this conference. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've had the opportunity to share my work with you. We were talking earlier in the day about how migration is personal, and Anacelia said we should all be sharing the personal, since it is so personal, migration. Uh, so I was gonna share that my mother came to the United States from Cuba in, the in early 1960s during the Cuban Revolution, and my father came to the United States in uh, the 1960s from Iraq, and my stepmother, who raised me, uh, came from Colombia in the 1980s, so migration is indeed uh, very personal since I was raised by a team of immigrants. And the work that I'm presenting is also very personal to me. So on the program it says that I would be presenting on the Muslim ban, but I have changed my topic. My broader work is about the cultural politics of Arabs and Muslims in the US. Uh, my prior work on representations of Arabs and Muslims in the US media. And I wanted to pre present some uh, new work <coughs> that's still in progress, working towards a, a second book. And so this project is about cases in which Muslim youth have been murdered and in which their cases were not labeled a hate crime and to raise questions around the limits of hate crime laws. Uh, I should also note that uh, doing this work and reading police reports, uh, cases, reading the details of murder has been very difficult. I spent a lot of time crying while I'm typing at my computer. Uh, so warning in advance, it's a heavy topic. But. Here we go. So I apologize for changing my paper. I hope you didn't come to hear about the Muslim ban and uh, hope this will be equally satisfying. I emailed Danny last week and I said, my colleagues change their paper topic all the time, but I've never done that before. Is it okay? Oh yeah, I said, go ahead and do it. So uh, this is a work in progress, uh, a new book that I'm working <coughs> on entitled Stealth Anti-Muslim Racism in an Age of Islamophobia. Uh, the title of my paper is How Hate Crime Laws Perpetuate Anti-Muslim Racism. Uh, so since this is a work in progress, what I'd like to do is introduce the topic, my argument, and then three ways that I'm thinking about the material. <clears throat> On February 10th, 2015, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Stephen Hicks, a 46-year-old white male car part salesman, murdered his neighbors. Three Muslim American students, Dia Badakat, age 23, his wife, Yusur Abu Salha, age 21, and her sister, Razan Abu Salha, age 19. He shot each of them in the head. The FBI labeled the murders a parking dispute, not a hate crime. I'm gonna show a clip from CNN uh, to give some background on this case. Chilling 911 calls describe a horrifying scene. <laughs> shot in an apartment. I don't know the number, about three girls Three Muslim students shot dead near the campus of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill Tuesday night. Chapel Hill police say they are investigating the possibility the shooting was a hate crime, targeting the three students for their Muslim faith. The preliminary investigation says the incident began as a dispute over parking, but angry family members insist this had nothing to do with the parking spot. A family spokesperson says the suspect had threatened the victims before. We ask that the authorities investigate these senseless and heinous murders as a hate crime. But his wife has come out saying this has nothing to do with religion. I can't say with my absolute belief that this incident had nothing to do with religion or victims' faith. The alleged shooter, 46-year-old Stephen <coughs> Hicks, turned himself in last night and is being held without bond on three counts of first-degree murder. Hicks, who claims he is an atheist, allegedly posted anti-religious statements on his Facebook page, writing, quote, when it comes to insults, your religion started this, not me. If your religion kept its big mouth shut, so would I. CNN could not independently confirm the authenticity of the post or his Facebook page. The victims, 23-year-old dentistry student, Dia Shadi Barakat, his 21-year-old wife of just over a month, Yusur Mohammed, and her 19-year-old sister, Razan Mohammed Abu Salah. 
Barakat was a second year student at the UNC School of Dentistry, who was raising money on a fundraising site to provide dental care to Syrian refugees in Turkey. So as the clip mentions, the murder of these three Arab American Muslim youth sparked a debate over whether or not these deaths were the result of a hate crime or a parking dispute. Hicks turned himself in and was charged with three counts of first degree murder. His wife Karen insisted that the murders, and I quote, had nothing to do with the long, ha had to do with the long standing parking disputes that my husband had with the neighbors. He often champions on his Facebook page for the rights of many individuals, same sex marriages, abortion, race. He just believes <coughs> everyone is equal, end quote. Two years later, on June 18, 2017, in Reston, Virginia, 22-year-old Darwin Martinez Torres, a construction worker and undocumented immigrant from El Salvador, killed Nabra Hassanin, age 17, in what law enforcement classified as road rage. On the day after Hassanin's body was recovered, the Fairfax County Police Department released information about the incident on their website. It explains that at around 3.40 a.m. on a Sunday, a group of 15 teenagers were walking and bike riding from a fast food restaurant back to all Dulles area Muslim Society, also known as the Adams Center, where they were attending an overnight event. It was uh, the holy month of Ramadan, so they went to IHOP to eat before sunrise. Some of the teens were on the sidewalk, others were on the road, when a neighborhood resident approached them in his car and got into an argument with them. He then got out of his car and chased them with a baseball bat. The teens ran away, but he captured 17-year-old Nabra Hassanin, hit her with the baseball bat, and then put her body in the car and threw it in a pond in Loudoun County, where the police later recovered it. Reports state that Nabra was still alive when Torres abducted her and that he assaulted her again, this time to death, before abandoning her body at the pond. Later reports reveal that Torres raped Hassanin before killing her. Torres was officially charged with abduction, with intent to defile, first degree murder, and rape. The police were clear in their statements that despite the fact that a group of Muslim teens were attacked and that Nabra wore a hijab, this was not to be classified a hate crime. Fairfax County Police spokesperson Julie Parker said at a news conference that there was no evidence that the crime was motivated by race or religion and added that there was no <coughs> evidence that Torres used any racial slurs as he chased the group of teens. Tawny Wright, another spokesperson with the Fairfax Police Department, said, and I quote, everyone looks at this crime and thinks that because the victims are participating in activities at a mosque, they assume that's what it was. It seems like a guy got enraged and just went after the victim who was closest to him, end quote. In both cases, the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE, and other civil rights groups challenged law enforcement about these classifications, insisting that they be investigated and classified as hate crimes. In the case of the Chapel Hill murders, over 150 civil rights groups signed a letter to Attorney General Eric Holder urging for a hate crime investigation. In the case of the Reston murder, CARE issued a public statement that stated, and I quote, as we grieve for Nabra's loss, we also urge law enforcement authorities to conduct a thorough investigation of a possible bias motive in the case, coming as it does at a time of rising Islamophobia and anti-Muslim hate attacks nationwide, end quote. <coughs> so why would law enforcement be reluctant to label these cases in which Muslim youth are murdered as hate crimes? By not calling it a hate crime, what work does it do for anti-Muslim racism? I argue that, quote unquote, not a hate crime, allows for the diminishment and denial of anti-Muslim racism, and that the diminishment and denial of anti-Muslim racism should be understood as a form of racial gaslighting. That is, a systematic denial of the persistence and severity of racism. Thus, one of the aims of this work is to develop a theory on racial gaslighting and how it produces anti-Muslim racism. I'm going to outline three problematics that arise in thinking through the denial of hate crime classifications. But first, what is gaslighting and racial gaslighting? Gaslighting is a psychological term that originated in the 1938 play Gaslight that was later adapted into a film in 1944. The film is about an abusive husband who intentionally drives his wife to question her sanity so that he can conceal his criminal activity from her. The term gaslighting derives from the husband denying that he had dimmed the gas lights in the house 
insisting that she imagined it. Thus, gaslighting refers to manipulating someone and driving them to the point of questioning their own sanity by controlling their perception of reality. More recently, it's been used in political contexts, for example, to describe Donald Trump when he made fun of a disabled reporter and denied that he had done so, and it's been used to refer to many other uh, statements and actions of Donald Trump. Some writers, mainly journalists and bloggers, have also used the term to describe the denial of racism, for example, by labeling the Black Lives Matter movement anti-white and anti-police. Now, denying racism is not new. It's a central feature of racism and white supremacy. What I'm proposing in this chapter is using the concept of racial gaslighting <coughs> to understand anti-Muslim racism. I suggest that understanding how denial operates reveals the normalization of racialized violence. My thinking about hate crimes has been influenced by the work of Clara Lewis, who wrote a book on the cultural politics of hate crimes, Dean Spade, who has written on the limitations of hate crime laws on the trans community, and American Studies and Queer Studies scholars, Christina Hanhart and <coughs> So now I'm gonna to move towards outlining three problematics that become apparent when seeking to understand how racial gaslighting operates in these murder cases that will gesture towards a potential theory of racial gaslighting. So the three problems are with, first, the definition of a hate crime, second, law enforcement's approach to hate crimes, and third, the limits of seeking state recognition for hate crimes. So first, the problem with hate crime definitions. So a bit of background on hate crime laws and definitions. So hate crime laws, very, very brief, uh, date back to the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which made it illegal to threaten or interfere with a person because of their race, color, religion, or national origin. A slew of hate crime legislation was passed in the 1990s and 2000s that involved requiring the Attorney General to collect data on hate crimes annually increasing penalties for hate crimes, and expanding the identities acknowledged to include sexual orientation, disability, and gender identity. And not all states, it's not equal across states, some states do not, still don't acknowledge gender identity. And in order for a hate crime, in order for a crime to be classified <coughs> as a hate crime, it needs to meet certain criteria, two in particular. First, the act needs to qualify as a crime. This might seem obvious, but the point of this criterion is to distinguish between illegal activity and hateful speech and actions that are protected by the Constitution. Hateful actions such as yelling racial slurs or spreading racist flyers are protected speech and not considered to be a crime. In other words, the hate crime designation is applied to an existing or established crime, vandalism, arson, murder, and not a distinct category in itself. Second, once a particular crime has been confirmed, then it can be elevated to a hate crime if evidence suggests that the motive was hateful. So what determines a hateful motive? Did the attacker yell, slurs, or otherwise say anything explicitly anti-gay, racist, or Islamophobic during the act? Does the attacker have a history, perhaps on social media or in other writings, of discriminatory ideas? Thus, if an attacker did not say something anti-Muslim while committing an attack against a Muslim, or if their Facebook profile does not exhibit anti-Muslim sentiments, then the act would not be classified as a hate crime. The criteria used to determine whether or not a particular crime is a hate crime is based on the assumption that racism is always necessarily overt and thus overlooks or denies not only that racism comes in multiple forms, but also that it's deeply embedded in US culture and hard, if not impossible, to disentangle from an imagined category of violence that's free from a history of Eurocentrism and white supremacy. As a result, those that do not fit the criteria are designated as not a hate crime. This was the case with Craig Hicks and Darwin Torres. <coughs> Muslim Americans claimed that the murders in Chapel Hill were surely a hate crime, given that Yusur and Razan both wore the hijab and were visibly Muslim. However, 
insistence that this was a hate crime was countered with evidence to the contrary. Hicks did not fit the profile of the standard hater. His Facebook and other online posts revealed that he's an atheist who is against all religion, regardless of whether it is Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. On Facebook, alongside rants against religion, he had also expressed support for freedom of speech and freedom of religion, support for the right to bear arms, and also for gay marriage rights. An op-ed in the Los Angeles Times describes him as a militant <coughs> atheist and reports that his <coughs> Facebook page included attacks on religion in general and a statement posted in 2012, and I quote, I hate Islam as much as Christianity, but they have the right to worship in this country just as much as others do, end quote. His archive posts even include commentary on the Ground Zero Mosque controversy, whereby Hicks stated that Muslims are entitled to the right to practice their faith and noting that there's a distinction between Muslims and Muslim extremists. And on this slide, you'll notice this is one of his uh, rants against religion. Looks like something is reposted. It says, why are radical Christians and radical Muslims so opposed to each other's influence when they agree about so many ideological issues? And a list, they oppose abortion, oppose birth control, oppose drug legalization, oppose gay marriage, etc. And then uh, many of his posts uh, boast uh, his gun ownership and his support for the Second Amendment. So many saw this and said, well, it doesn't fit the profile of the traditional hater because he hates all religion, he sometimes argues for freedom of religion, and so this image that the hater is a classic white supremacist, there's a vision that we had, his profile did not fit that. I should also mention uh, that neighbors who lived in the same apartment complex uh, had complained to each other about how aggressive Hicks was about parking, and he was known as a parking bully in his apartment complex. However, on the day of the murder, none of the three students' cars were parked in the disputed spot. Craig Hicks' profile does not fit the operating formula of someone who would commit a hate crime, a white supremacist. But this does not mean that the death of these three Muslim youth does not constitute one. The ways in which Craig Hicks does not fit the profile of hate reveal the limits and problems with how racism is conceptualized, that it is recognized only in its most explicit forms. This rigid conception of hate crimes and by default racism individualizes racism and thus makes systemic racism <coughs> invisible. Dean Spade notes that, and I quote, the law's adoption of this conception of racism makes it ineffective at eradicating racism and helps it contribute to obscuring the actual operations of racism, end quote. This narrow definition not only has the consequence of individualizing racism and recognizing it only when it comes in its most overt and extreme forms, but it also exceptionalizes racism and other forms of discrimination. Clara Lewis's work has shown that hate crime coverage in the news by focusing on the most extreme cases like murder, have the impact of portraying hate crimes as exceptional, as something that's both extreme and done by people that most people can't relate to. And therefore, since we can't relate to it, it's extreme, it has nothing to do with me. So it's not seen as a cultural problem, but rather as a fringe or exceptional problem that will be handled with extreme measures like the death penalty. Lewis says that audiences can feel that justice has been served and that they have adequately reacted to the injustice without implicating themselves or disturbing the social order. If hate crime designations and the media coverage of them have the impact of portraying racism as an individualized, extreme, and exceptional phenomenon, then how can we think about these murder cases when they are not even classified as a hate crime? By not classifying these murders as hate crimes, racism becomes even further exceptionalized. This classification conveys that even extreme individual violence doesn't constitute racism. It insists that racialized violence can be innocent of the racialized part, that it is possible to be race neutral, and in doing so, exceptionalizes Muslims' frequent exposure to hate crimes. In this case, parking dispute reclassifies <coughs> reality through an act of labeling, coding a crime as race neutral when it is anything but. 
in the interest of time, I'm not going to do a parallel uh, analysis of Darwin Torres, or I will be speaking of that case uh, in the next section. But I do want to mark that he did not have a social media presence. Reports indicate that Torres accused one of the teens of blocking the road, the teen was riding his bike on the road, and that an argument ensued. The details of what was said is unclear, but what is clear <coughs> is that law enforcement says that no racial slurs were uttered. And I will talk a little bit about Torres uh, in a moment, but I should note that I've done a lot of research on him and there's very little available. So it's just repeated over and over again that he was undocumented, that he lived with his grandmother, that he asked for a translator. It's unclear if he asked for a translator because English is a second language or because he doesn't speak English. It's very, very unclear. But those are the pieces of information that are repeated <coughs> over and over again. And with uh, Stephen Hicks, there's a much more filled out profile of who he is. So the second problematic is with the approach to hate crimes, particularly the tough on crime approach. Clara Lewis in her book on the cultural politics of hate crime laws argues that, and I quote, rising public recognition of hate crimes during the late 1980s and 1990s coincided, not accidentally, with the overarching ascendance of both neoliberalism and crime control culture, end quote. In the 1980s and 1990s, a tough on crime approach emerged that led to an obsession with crime and punishment. And this included cop shows like Law and Order or Forensic Files, it's still very popular on CNN. It also included the development of the prison industrial complex. And this is also when hate crime laws were developing. So hate crime laws were developing alongside the, the tough on crime approach. Lewis writes, and I quote, neoliberal state policy and popular thought affected how hate crimes were understood. In this context, the condemnation of the individual hate crime perpetrator took precedence over broader structural critiques and the radicalism of civil rights lost ground to tough on crime sentiments and neoliberal policies, end quote. In this process, hate crime laws have become divested of their civil rights objectives and folded into <coughs> this tough on crime approach. The result with these cases in which Muslim youth are killed and it's not labeled a hate crime is a further divestment of any civil rights meaning since they're not even labeled a hate crime. So on the one hand, we have divestment of civil rights that happens because of the tough on crime approach and then not even acknowledging it as a hate crime is a further distancing of hate crime laws from a uh, civil rights context. I'm going to show a one-minute clip from a press conference that was held by the Fairfax County Police Department about Nabra Hassanin's murder. An autopsy this afternoon has revealed that the body recovered from a pond in Loudoun County is that of a arrested teenager who went missing early Sunday morning. The victim has been identified as 17-year-old Nabra Hassanin of Reston. The autopsy results show that Nabra suffered blunt force trauma to the upper body after a road rage incident. Darwin Martinez Torres, who is 22 of Sterling, is charged with her murder. Nothing indicates that this was motivated by race or by religion. It appears the suspect became so enraged over this traffic argument that it escalated into deadly violence. How can I even begin to convey our sadness and sorrow at the loss of such a beautiful young girl whose death has come not only too soon, but in the most tragic and brutal means possible? I can assure you that while justice will not bring Nabra Hassan on back, justice will be done, as the suspect of this brutal attack is in custody and will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law made clear at the press conference that Torres will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law, that he will be severely penalized regardless of the designation. Justice in the form of punishment is offered as the solution. And I'm not seeking to downplay the significance <coughs> that murder is taken seriously, especially in light of how there is no accountability for African Americans killed by police officers. But I do want to highlight that this assurance often comes at the expense of the recognition that the murder constitutes a hate crime. 
My point here is that at the same time that police labeling codes these acts of violence as not a hate crime, they reclassify them within the framework of tough on crime neoliberal policing. In other hate crimes that I've investigated against Muslims and also against <coughs> trans people, there are many hate crimes against trans people that are also fall in this category of not being labeled as a hate crime. Uh, and that do not make headline news. It's significant, actually. Uh, when Clara Lewis published her book on the cultural politics of hate crime, it was published in 2010, she noted in the book that there had yet to be one hate crime case uh, that made headline news in which a Muslim was murdered. And so these two are significant in making headline news. There aren't many out there. But I've noticed in my research that in these press conferences and op-eds, a few common gaslighting utterances emerge. Law enforcement commonly say things like, all murders are hateful, or that the classification is irrelevant since the perpetrator will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. The logic here is that while a hate crime charge could increase the penalty if the crime is vandalism, it does not increase the penalty in the case of murder since murder already presumably comes with a significant penalty. Thus, some argue that seeking a hate crime charge in the case of murder is futile, while others say that it has important symbolic meaning. So these kinds of debates, I should note, also took place in op-eds, where some who were writing op-eds said, who cares if whether it's a hate crime or not? They're still going to jail. They're still going to get a life sentence. They might get the death penalty. What does it matter? And others argued that uh, it did matter, at least symbolically, that it had holds an important symbolic function. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, detained Torres, and news reports state that prosecutors intend to pursue the death penalty. In the case of Craig Hicks, reports indicate that he may face or could face the death penalty if convicted. It is likely that both will face the death penalty but the language used in reporting about an undocumented immigrant from El Salvador and a white man did lead to different media frames as well as public reactions. And I'd be happy to talk during the Q&A about the public reaction with Torres. Uh, the right ended up taking his case and using it um, to criticize the left for being too soft on immigration and saying, okay, you on the left, you wanna be soft on immigration, this is what you're gonna get, you're gonna get murderers. Uh, so they use this opportunity to uh, advance that argument. There is a disconnect between concern for crime and concern for civil rights, revealing that ultimately it's not about social justice and combating racism, homophobia, <coughs> and transphobia when it comes to hate crime laws, but rather it's about punishing individual civilian crime, not police crime, particularly extreme forms such as murder. So it does not matter from the perspective of law enforcement whether these cases are labeled as hate crimes or not. According to law enforcement, what matters is that the case is being taken seriously because the perpetrator was arrested and is being charged with murder. I'm gonna move now to the third problematic. And the third and final problem has to do with seeking state recognition, which I see as posing a dilemma. Marginalized communities, in this case, Arabs and Muslims, want their experiences to be recognized by the state, despite the ways in which they are treated by the national security state. When considering violence to which Muslims are subjected, we must think about a war on Afghanistan that has killed 30,000 Afghan civilians, a war on Iraq that had nothing to do with 9-11 that has killed over 150,000 Iraqi civilians, Guantanamo Bay Prison, Abu Ghraib Prison, Extraordinary Rendition, the Patriot Act, Special Registration, Countering Violent Extremism, the Muslim Ban, and the list goes on. Hate crimes are but one facet of the multi-dimensional violence that Arabs and Muslims and those mistaken to be Arab or Muslim face today. And more importantly, hate crimes are deeply connected and shaped by state policies. The War on Terror and Patriot Act, for example, convey that Muslims are a threat and un-American. Seeking recognition from the state, I would argue, is important for symbolic reasons. 
I do believe that communities need state recognition to push back against gaslighting and having their experiences negated. But conversations about hate crimes tend to not go hand in hand with other forms of violence to which Arabs and Muslims are subjected. Arab and Muslim Americans are vulnerable to many forms of violence, yet hate crime <coughs> debates give the impression that this is the primary form of violence. What about state violence? What about how state violence inspires hate crimes? What about how Muslim Americans are most often framed as either terrorist threats to national security or useful for national security purposes? I'd like to quickly consider two different community responses to these murders. The larger dilemma of seeking state recognition is highlighted when examining community responses to these two murder cases. So given that discourses around national security frame Muslims as good when they are patriotic in the most narrow sense of the term and support the state, it is not surprising that the mosque in Virginia, the Adam Center Al Dulles Area Muslim Society Center, asked the community not to insist on a hate crime designation regarding Nabra Hassanan and to entrust law enforcement with the process. The statement read, it's up here, we request the community <coughs> not to speculate on the motives <coughs> and jump to conclusions. We thank both Fairfax County Police and Loudoun County Sheriff's Department for their diligent efforts in investigating and charging the suspect with murder, end quote. The Adams Center values their connection to law enforcement and their role in the community as good Muslims, and by extension, promotes law enforcement's approach that involves minimizing the civil rights content and amplifying the law and order framing. In contrast, as I mentioned, Previously, a letter was sent to Attorney General Eric Holder, organized by CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, and signed by Arab, Jewish, Sikh, Asian American, Latino, LGBT, and other civil rights groups, urging a federal hate crime investigation in the case of the Chapel Hill murders. The letter, the letter points to a larger context of Islamophobia to justify why these murders should be investigated as a hate crime. It reads, these killings come in the wake of a disturbing rise in especially threatening and vitriolic anti-Muslim rhetoric and activities. In recent weeks, after the release of the movie American Sniper, many tweeted hateful and deplorable messages demeaning to Muslims and Arabs. For example, one user tweeted that the film makes me want to go shoot some effing Arabs, while another stated that American Sniper makes me appreciate soldiers a hundred times more and hate Muslims a million times more. On Saturday, January 17, 2015, outside a Muslim community event in Garland, Texas, hundreds of protesters shouted hateful messages and comments at attendees. Some of the protesters brandished guns, creating a threatening and hostile environment for families attending the event. So I want to be careful to point out that the Council on American Islamic Relations and other civil rights groups do take on the state. However, in seeking recognition from the state, focus is on a climate of increased Islamophobia that is framed as disconnected from state practices. Islamophobia is conveyed here as an individual problem that essentially advances the problematic that I outlined with a conventional definition. In seeking recognition from the state, this letter embraces the definition of hate crimes and racism as an individual problem, but they do insist that it is not an exceptional problem. So it does diverge from the conventional definition in that way. They're trying to show hundreds of protesters, that it's not just one person and it's exceptional, that it's a really big, larger phenomenon. Thus, in both examples of advocacy, the problematic definition and approach are embraced in seeking state recognition. In the case of the letter to Attorney General Eric Holder, the problematic with the definition that racism is an individual problem gets reinscribed, but it does not advance that it is an exceptional problem. And in the case of the Adam Center, the problematic with the tough on crime approach that divests from civil rights gets reinscribed. As a side note, if we have time later, um, one of the other community responses was to create a hashtag Muslim Lives Matter that became very, very controversial and got shut down and faced a lot of criticism for appropriating 
that movement. Muslim communities are under surveillance. Mosques and even student groups like the Muslim Student Association and college campuses are infiltrated. There is a poverty in how terrorism is understood as being caused by Muslim extremism without attention to the role of US interventionist policies. So to what extent can law enforcement be seen as an ally to Muslim Americans? Dean Spade writes that we should guard against simply tinkering with systems to make them look more inclusive while leaving their most violent operations intact. And Chandan Reddy points out that the 2009 Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act was attached to the National Defense Authorization Act of 2010 in which Obama approved $690 billion to the Department of Defense. <coughs> and it included sending 10,000 more troops to Afghanistan and the continued use of unmanned drone strikes in countries such as Pakistan and Yemen, with whom the US is not at war. Reddy thus proposes that we see hate crime laws as attached to sanctioned state violence abroad. That we see, the title of his book, Freedom with Violence. And Christina Hanhart points out that, and I quote, hate crimes are distinguished from acts that are lawful, and that sanctioned state violence is intentionally left out of the definition because including the state would downplay the status of hate crimes as a category for state-administered condemnation, end quote. In other words, discussions about hate and discrimination are framed as the state protecting marginalized groups from attacks by individuals not from attacks by the state, or even attacks influenced by the state. To be clear, I'm not stating that Muslims should stop seeking recognition from the state. Rather, I'm asking what it would look like if conversations about hate crimes within the community extended beyond recognition from the state to include in the same frame other forms of violence, particularly state violence. And my larger point is that racial gaslighting operates by distancing hate crime violence from other forms of violence and approaching the state as if it is an arbiter of safety and security of protection and justice. The three strands I've been <coughs> seeking to highlight are as follows. <coughs> First, the problem revealed through the narrow definition of a hate crime is that by refusing to classify these murders as hate crimes, racism becomes further exceptionalized and experiences of Muslims with racism become gaslighted or denied. Second, the problem with the tough on crime approach reflects a further divestment of hate crimes from its civil rights origins and the insistence of pursuing justice through this approach gaslights anti-Muslim racism. And third, seeking recognition from the state exposes a dilemma since the state perpetuates violence against Muslim communities domestically and globally and inspires hate crimes. My hope, as I continue to develop this particular chapter, is to think about how these problematics work together in configuring racial gaslighting in the case of Muslim Americans, and also its implications for understanding how covert or subtle racism and other forms of discrimination operate today. In conclusion, Danny asked me to think about these three questions, which I think my paper already covered, but I thought I'd just explicitly address them quickly. Since that's the objective of the conference, right? To <laughs> talk about these questions. So the first question is, how do you see the role of the humanities in discussions of migration? And I think it's the role of the humanities to help us think beyond ex existing frameworks, to find better ways to think about the social and political <coughs> problems to think beyond the terms of a given debate. So for example, after 9-11, the US government often said we had a choice between security or liberty. We couldn't have both. And if we wanted civil liberties, then we deserved to be bombed. And that the clear choice would be, we want national security and we'll give up all of our civil liberties. So I see humanity scholars as trying to help us think beyond, because oftentimes these debates, you feel like you're trapped. You get, you get this or that, so to help us think beyond that. So how do we expand the framework and change the conversation <coughs> to be more useful? In this case, <coughs> the debate is whether or not it's a hate crime. Is it a hate crime, is it not a hate crime? And we can easily argue for one side or the other. But what are the implications and what are we overlooking? 
So I see humanities scholars as crucial in pushing us beyond the dominant frameworks in thinking about the most pressing social and political issues of our time and offering more useful ways to understand them. The second question, how does your work challenge or respond to current migration policies and public perceptions? So in this case with the hate crime research, uh, I'm asking is there another way to think about hate crimes laws beyond the individual hater and the state issuing a punitive response? So on the one hand, the Trump administration is banning Muslims from entering the US and creating the perception that they are all dangerous. And on the other, and partly as a result, Muslims in the US are susceptible to violence from individuals and surveillance and violence from the government. So how do we think about these together? And to add another layer, how do we also think about the role of the US government in creating refugees? Iraqi refugees, for example, trying to come find another place to live because the United States waged a war under false pretenses that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And third and finally, how does your current migration research frame issues of globalization? So with this research, I'm hoping to show that we need to understand hate crimes as connected to US foreign policies and that the local is indeed connected to global events. Thank you.